We were making our way home after seeing some family. Seems normal, right? A simple visit, if only that was the case. The visit was just the start of it. The drive home after was when it happened. Some foul nightmare followed us. We weren't to know what it was, but it certainly knew who we were. December 26th, 2012. My family and I were driving down south from Preston after what had originally been such a heartwarming stay at my grandparents over Christmas break. Don't you guys think Granny was acting a little strange? My dad suddenly blurted out. We had been sitting in the car for just over three hours, so it was incredibly odd for him to just come up with that out of nowhere. My mom replied with nothing more than I guess. Why'd you say that? Her voice perked up out of curiosity, looking intensely into my dad's eyes, almost trying to find an answer in his pupils. No, no, it was just that he paused for a moment, hesitating, choosing his words carefully. It's just what she said to me. It was a bit weird, and it kind of put me off driving home. His face looked grimaced, contorted into a stern look, his eyes glaring at the road ahead. It was incredibly dark outside, and there was little to see apart from the wasteland of road and the old lamppost every now and then. Though slightly on edge myself now, I still leaned in to find out more what my gran had said to my father. Well, go on then, Harry, you may as well tell me. And it can't be that bad considering she's just a sweet old lady. My dad, Harry, didn't even blink. His mouth simply quivered momentarily, until finally he spoke. It was the night before we left. You and George were upstairs getting him ready for bed, and I was still in the chair asleep. When I stood up to come join you two, Grandma walked in with this wicked-looking grin on her face, directing it heavily towards me. I tried telling her that I was going to bed, but her grin bewitched me, so I sat down, thinking she would tell me what was up, but she just stood there, glaring at me with a goddamn smile. I hated it, but my body wouldn't move. I mean, I take it my nerves were frozen out of panic, but nothing prepared for me from when she suddenly stopped smiling, opened her mouth, and in this low growl of a voice, spoke the words, Watch the roads tomorrow, Harry. I hear that most crashes happen late at night. What a shame it would be for your lovely wife and son to die as a result of one. Death is such a confusing concept, isn't it, Harry? I wish we could all experience it, just to know what the other side is like, or at least for the rest of you. I sat there, trembling in terror at her abrupt finish, leaving the both of us in pure silence. I was so unbelievably petrified. I just, I didn't know how to react. I left as soon as I could, her evil grin seeming to follow me upstairs. My heart was so tightly clasped at the hands of fright that I had to sit back and stop myself from collapsing between the two front seats my parents were in. My mom, on the other hand, looked pale as death. Her humorous laughter had suddenly evaporated, and what was left didn't seem to match her usual personality at all. Okay, Harry, don't be so silly. You know your mother wouldn't act in such a way. She has the soul of an angel. You might have been dreaming. My mom tried to calm down the atmosphere in the car, but the vacancy of meaning in her words did little to secure their bewildered mental stability, which I could practically see draining onto the floor below. It was at that moment my dad finally turned his head for a split second to try to give my mom a comforting look. That's when the lights on the road disappeared. We had been driving for several miles down a smaller road that was going to lead onto the motorway. The journey took us through miles of country and the quality of lampposts had been gradually declining the further we drove along, until eventually we reached the point where the gradual decline became a plummet, and we were left with practically no light, aside from the faint glow of my mom's phone screen facing upwards of the seat next to her. My dad's head suddenly flicked back to the road, and he immediately switched on the high beams of the headlights, the lighting which tends to reveal certain images of reality that one normally doesn't see when in the usual light of the lampposts. Standing on the road in front of us, what's this estranged figure that didn't seem human, but instead gave off the atmosphere of danger, eeriness? And that's when all three of our eyes connected with its ominous glare. The wheels of the car twisted 
at a 90-degree rotational turn that threw us straight into a dirt ditch, parallel to the position of which the creature stood. My dad slammed his foot down into the bridge to avoid us, smashing straight into the line of trees covering the rim of the ditch. The three of us sat quietly in that ditch for several minutes. We were paralyzed with fear and could sense something walking down towards us. There was a faint rumble in the ground, as bits of dirt scattered down towards us, notifying us of another presence. My dad prepared himself to launch his fist at whoever dared glance through the car window. The footsteps got closer and closer. They felt like they were on top of us, scuttling about, but with a sort of motion you'd only find in some kind of worked beast not native to the earth. All three of us visibly lost all sense of ourselves in that moment. That terror engulfed each one of us in its faint, horrific grip until I eventually turned my head. Standing there, staring through my window, was a random person waving at us to get our attention. My dad slightly rolled down the window to hear him. Hey there, you folks all right? The man asked kind-heartedly. Our fears were subsiding. This man seemed friendly, and we stepped out shortly after explaining what happened. My dad had to ask it though. Hey man, I have to ask you, what were you doing standing in the middle of the road in the middle of the night? We all stared at him inquisitively as we were waiting for a tow truck to come along. Standing in the middle of the road. No sir, I was driving behind you when I saw you guys suddenly swerve off into the ditch. I was too focused on the crash that I never looked what was on the road before I got out to come help you. The realization hit us like a motorway of trucks. My parents looked at each other with a look of intense terror once more. They grabbed my arm and held me close. The thing or the person that caused us to swerve was still a mystery, and to be honest, we felt far from being safe. We didn't want to stay there any longer. The tow truck came about an hour later, and the man who helped us said his goodbyes and drove off. As we sat in the tow truck whilst our car was hauled out of the ditch, all three of us were glaring back at the spot the creature once was. Granny's ominous words and horrifying figure of the creature haunted us throughout our entire journey back home. Time for a road trip. I laughed at my best friend's enthusiasm. I shared her excitement. We had been planning and looking forward to this road trip forever. We were on our mid-semester break, and we really needed this trip to unwind from college stress. We were in our final year and school had been really stressful as of late. Like me, Ellen was the only child of her parents. Perhaps that was the reason why we got along so well. We had been close friends for about three years now. I didn't know how my college life would have been without her. We were outside the dorm, saying goodbye to everyone and heading home for the break. We already informed our parents that we would be spending the break together. We had our bags packed and ready in no time. We were in the car, ready to leave. I was the one driving since it was my car. It was a gift from my parents on my 21st birthday. The car was my prized possession, and I made sure to take care of it. Ellen put the address in the car's navigation system, and we were ready to go. The trip was supposed to be three hours long, and then we would arrive at the resort where we were already booked at. Everything started out well. Ellen and I talked about the courses we took and how difficult they were. We gossiped about the boys and lectures in the school. It was fun being with Ellen and I was grateful for our friendship. Just about two hours in, my gas signal started to blink and I decided to stop for a refill at the gas station I saw. I found one in about 10 minutes and I drove in. I made sure to hurry because I didn't want to delay her trip. As I went to get the nozzle, I heard a shout from behind me. I turned back confused only to see a guy waving a gun and yelling at me to get on the ground. He had a scar running down the side of his face and he looked downright terrifying. There was another guy close to the entrance and he held a gun out too. I looked at Ellen in alarm and she froze in fear. Then I saw that the other cars were empty. This was a setup for people like us who wanted to get gas. This place was so far away from town that they would be able to get away with it too. We were about to get robbed. I stood in fear, the nozzle still in my hand. 
Seeing people get robbed in movies was one thing. Having the experience yourself was a different ballgame entirely. It felt surreal, like I wasn't the one it was happening to. The guy yelled that if we didn't get on the ground, he was going to hurt us. He was pretty graphic about the things he was going to tell us to do. He threatened us with a kind of violence I can't speak of. I dropped the nozzle and yelled at Ellen to comply, but she didn't seem to hear me. Her chest rose and fell rapidly as she stared straight ahead. Ellen was prone to having panic attacks, and this search situation was hell. My fear turned to worry for her and my brain raced as I thought of what to do. Get on the floor now, bitch, or I'll pump your head full of bullets. They wanted to ransack the car, and they could only do that successfully if we weren't in the car. I didn't find out if the threats were valid or not. I couldn't risk it. I just wanted Ellen to be okay. I thought of what I could do as the guy was already getting frustrated with Ellen's unresponsiveness. Please, let my friend get out. I pleaded and held my breath. I hope he said yes because it was our chance to escape. He waved his gun for me to proceed, and I entered the car and shook Ellen. Her eyes slid to mine, and I could see utter terror in her eyes. She was panting and I told her to just focus on breathing. Be quick about it. Without thinking twice, I started the car. I heard the guy curse, and then I heard the sound of a car starting. I looked in the rearview mirror to see that he was chasing us. He probably never thought that I would use the opportunity to escape. It seemed like my best option at the time. Now that they were chasing us, I prayed that I didn't make the wrong choice. Everything is going to be fine. I assured Ellen, and she nodded. Something metallic hit the car, and I yelled for Ellen to duck as I tried to do the same. I looked back to see that they were shooting at us. The guy that was yelling, who I assumed to be the leader, was leaning out of the car trying to aim his gun at us. Shit. I muttered, trying to swallow my fear. I was trying so hard to be the stronger one of us, but I didn't want to die. We were too young to die. Their car was close to us now. I kept my head as low as I could afford and tried to increase the speed. They rammed into us from behind and hit my head with the steering wheel. I grunted in pain but kept my grip steady. Ellen was crying and shaking as she bent down in the co-driver's seat. Another shot hit the side of the car, and I flinched. I cursed the road for being so lonely. We hadn't ever run into another driver out here. There was no one that could help us. Suddenly, an idea came to mind, and I hoped that it would work. I waited till they wanted to ram into us again. Watching them closely, when the car picked up speed suddenly, I slowed down and swerved to the side. They sped past us. I stepped on the accelerator and turned the car sharply in their direction. We hit the road, and the guy driving lost control of the road. Everything happened so fast. Ellen and I watched as their car careened off the road. I didn't know if they were going to survive that. And frankly, I didn't care. I hoped they didn't. My hands were still shaking on the steering wheel, and I tried to calm myself down. After making sure that we were both fine, I continued driving in silence. Thankfully, the reserve fuel lasted till we got to our destination. I couldn't dare enter another gas station. Not possible. We got to the resort a little shaken, but okay. The whole incident had put a downer on our moods, but we decided to try and enjoy ourselves. Surely, this was one road trip we wouldn't be forgetting soon. The pending dinner didn't have anything to do with the joy that illuminated my heart the moment I woke up that morning. If anything, the dinner caused anxiety to wreck me and propound my mind with a million ways on how everything could go wrong. My lungs constricted at the thought of the 20-year-long routine. If only I could put a stop to it. The joy had more to do with the birthday of my only daughter, Emma, and the chance to see her again. It sprung me out of bed faster than my alarm tone and into the bathroom. I didn't want to conclude that the reason for my happiness was her freedom and the chance to see her more often than her mother, my ex-wife Michael, permitted while she was under her jurisdiction. An umbrella that Emma could walk out of if she so wished. 
Maybe it was Thanksgiving and I would be in my ex-wife's apartment once again. It didn't matter. My daughter was turning 18 and I wanted to look my best. My preparation was on the extra level. I took careful measures to choose my shirt and the color of the suit. It needed to be to the liking of Emma, my precious baby girl forever. The only good thing that came out of my 10-year-old relationship with Michael. It wasn't long before I stepped out of the house into my newly purchased car and started my journey to the other side of town. I didn't want to admit it, but I bought the new car to impress Emma. Sometimes I hoped that she would recognize that I was richer than her mom and choose me, especially now that the ball was in her court. It was sly, but I loved her and I couldn't risk thinking that if she spent too much time with her mom, she would become like her. Michael wasn't always someone I wanted to avoid. She was a sweet soul, a woman I fell in love with, the woman I could swear I would live the rest of my life with. But all that changed when she opened up a side of mine that I had never encountered in my whole life. A dark side that swelled in anger and swam in pushing blame. A part of me that she opened one Thanksgiving ten years ago. I pushed my thoughts aside as I arrived at the apartment. Emma lived in with Mikkel a couple of hours later. The one who rushed to open the door for me and throw me into a longing hug was Emma. Even though Michael was not in sight, I could smell her jealousy and the tantalizing smell of delicious steaming soup that filled the atmosphere. I could hear her grunt when I pecked Emma on her cheek and ran my fingers through her hair. How I loved her dearly. She helped me into the house, collecting the basket of dessert I brought along. That part of the Thanksgiving dinner was mine to decide. It had always been mine to decide. Michael appeared from the kitchen a few minutes later, plastered a fake smile between her cheeks, and mumbled a high and a quick hug before she disappeared again. Emma shrugged at the behavior, but didn't stop the gist about the birthday gift her current boyfriend sent to her for her birthday. If anything, I was glad that my daughter loved me nonetheless, and found me worthy enough to listen to the teeny-weeny details of her life. Michael interrupted us later when she requested that we set the table and get prepared for dinner. Emma rushed to the kitchen to help with the servings while I arranged the dining table and also placed the centerpiece with carefulness. Some minutes later, we were seated around the table, turkey in the middle, Emma's birthday cake by the side, and the other side dishes. It was easy to tell that Michael was well-behaved because it was Emma's birthday. In previous times, she was bound to have found something wrong with the centerpiece or my dessert or anything at all as long as it caused a misunderstanding or a fight. I could never understand why she invited me for dinner every year even after we divorced. I could never understand why I still honored the invitation even after eight years. But I was glad that the day was different that she chose silence over anger, pride, or whatever it was. I was glad that she honored her daughter's day. But that gladness didn't hold water for long. The moment I took a spoon from the soup placed in front of me, I knew trouble was bound to occur. Deja vu was never wrong. Michael messed up the recipe in my bowl. I spewed the soup back into the bowl. Michael chuckled, and Emma looked up, puzzled. You did it on purpose, didn't you? I said, but she hummed and continued to eat quietly from her plate, slicing through her food like someone who had no worries at all. My anger took the best of me, and I was holding her by the neck. Emma jumped out of her chair. The next few minutes passed in a frenzied haze with the two of us, Michael and me, shouting at the top of our voices, reminding ourselves of why we weren't supposed to be together. At that point, we totally forgot that we were ruining the special day of our daughter until her sobs and screams grew louder than ours. Shane washed through me, and anger split through my eyes as Michael shouted that it was all my fault and I shouldn't have come. Of course, the whole neighborhood had witnessed our fight, like they did every Thanksgiving. The same way we started ten years ago, before we divorced when Michael made a mistake with the Thanksgiving soup but claimed she wasn't the one. I looked at my red-eyed daughter and venom-eyed ex-wife. I picked up my car keys and retreated, leaving the house for them. Whether it was Michael's mistake or not, it was mine for showing up just because I was invited. Emma didn't deserve for her day to be ruined. I ignited the engine of my car 
and disappeared into the middle of the road back to my house. I wasn't far gone when my phone began to ring. Emma's call for help sent me speeding back toward the apartment, but I was late. I should have known from how eerie it felt the moment I parked in front of the apartment again. I rushed into the house, and I couldn't believe my eyes. Emma and Michael were in the house, tied by the legs up to the ceiling. Blood dripped from their hanging necks that faced the ground. I stood in shock and didn't know when police officers entered the apartment. They cuffed my hands and dragged me out of the house while I processed the death of my ex-wife and only daughter. Although I was released a few days later, when the officers confirmed that I was not in the neighborhood at the time of death, their murderer was never caught, and I wake up with the image of their bizarre bodies in my head forever. I still shiver when I think about that Thanksgiving. Had I controlled my anger and stayed, my family would have been alive. But my friends, if you're still with me here, please be there with your family when they need you. While we think that we have all the time in this world, we don't realize that time is limited.